The first thing to note about the Kingdom of the Galatians, as the Greeks came to call it, is that it was no true kingdom at all. In the autumn of the year 475 Ab Urbi Condita, Galatia was in truth ruled by a triumvirate. The Gallic Confederation settled around Ancyra was composed of a number of tribes, with three large ones chief amongst them. These three were the Tectosiges, the Trochmai, and the Tulistobogi. The senior member of the three was the Tectosiges, ruled by King Magarix, whose seat of power rested in Ancyra itself. The other two lived within the province elsewhere, in the fortresses which I refer to here as Tavium and Pessinus, though at that time they would be more accurately described as armed encampments. The tribes ruled over the local Greek and Cappadocian populations as a military aristocracy, similar in nature to that of the Spartans of Greece, even if by coincidence and not design. The locals were largely free to continue their lives as they had prior to the Gauls' arrival, though they were made to pay tremendous tributes to each of the respective tribes. In return, the Gauls extended over them their personal protection, and did not at this time enlist them in their military ventures in the region. Magarix was the son of the recently departed Leonorios, one of the two warlords whom the tribes had followed to this land to begin with. A young man in the prime of his vigour, he was popular among his contemporaries who deferred to his leadership in spite of being his senior. Considered generally just and fair in his dealings, if Magarix could be said to have two vices, they were chiefly that he was given to the profligate spending of his wealth and that in almost all affairs he was ruled by the will of his wife, a noblewoman called Melina. We shall speak more of her later. I had the honour of their company almost as soon as I arrived in Ancyra. I was met at the city gates by a rough-looking Gaul called Preto. Ostensibly, he was one of the king's scouts, but his purview went far beyond simply matters of military reconnaissance, as I soon learned. News of a wealthy Roman patrician travelling to the city had apparently preceded my arrival, and Preto explained to me in shockingly fluent Greek that it would please the king to receive me in his hall at my earliest convenience. The king's hall, as it transpired, was the reappropriated estate of one of the city's former landowners, a far cry from the windy timber construction one might have expected. Magarix sat upon his throne, greeted me, and politely bade me share news that I had from the west. Rome's conflict with Pyrrhus of Epirus was of great interest to him, as it turned out. With me personally, however, I got the impression at some length that he was almost disappointed. Perhaps he expected a Roman equestrian in full military panoply, rather than myself in a dust-covered tunic and abola fresh from the road. As was the case with Preto, his command of the Greek language was impeccable, and this was the case with many of his people. This should come as no surprise, for Greek is spoken everywhere in this day and age from the foggy shores of Britannia to the far Indus. It is the language of trade and of the nobility far and wide, and the Gauls of Anatolia were well versed in its usage. I will not, in this account, however, make any attempt to rehabilitate the image of the Keltoi in the manner of other historians, such as Poseidonius. While the Gallic reputation for hospitality is rightfully deserved, and Magarix was by no means the savage forest creature of the Barbaricum than one might have expected, our initial meeting was nevertheless punctuated by the king proudly showing to me a portion of his collection of human heads. These articles in particular were those previously belonging to a number of Cappadocian soldiers that Magarix claimed to have personally slain in battle. The grizzly specimens were embalmed in cedar oil, as was customary, and kept in a finely decorated wooden chest, which he showed to me with great enthusiasm. As we shall discuss later, the human head plays a very important part in the spiritual beliefs of the Keltoi, and this was my initial and rather shocking introduction to what would become a familiar custom. Having sufficiently sated the king's curiosity, I was given my leave and showed to some quarters that his majesty had so kindly provided. The line I have found in Gallic culture between being an honoured guest and a prisoner is often blurred, as it was on this occasion. I was, however, permitted to move about the city as I liked, and so I began my studies anew over the following weeks, entirely unhindered and unlooked for by the king. We met again, however, after dark a month or so following our initial introduction. 
I was making my way home to the small villa provided to myself and my household from an evening spent at the city's decrepit and neglected Hall of Records when I encountered in the largely abandoned streets a number of cloaked figures with covered wagons outside the king's palace. Into them was being loaded gold and silver valuables of all kinds, while indoors the sound of a loud and raucous feast could be heard. I was apprehended at once by the men, who were led by Preto, and I was taken to Magarix's private chambers to be confronted by an incensed Gallic monarch, fresh from the feasting hall. There was an exchange of words in their native tongue before Magarix addressed me in Greek. He explained that, were I any other man, I would have been killed to preserve the secrecy of Preto's business, but some vagary of Gallic chivalry prevented him from doing so. I was a guest under his admittedly figurative roof, and was thus subject to the laws of hospitality. A more devious man might well have ignored this inconvenience, and had my throat cut regardless, but as discussed previously, Magarix was a man considered just and honourable among his people, and his actions that night proved no exception to the rule of his reputation. The wagons contained treasure that was being delivered in secret to Mithridates, king of Pontus, in exchange for an agreement between the two peoples. Pontus would recognise the Gauls' right to their newly settled land in the region, and in return, Magarix's people would refrain from raiding Pontic territory. For reasons which I gathered were religious in nature, giving such a large sum of treasure to a foreign ruler was considered taboo among these Gauls, and it was not Magarix's wish that this knowledge become public. He was especially keen that his rival chiefs of the Trochmai and the Tullistabogi remain unaware. By way of extricating myself from this position, I offered to swear upon Jupiter's stone, or rather a suitable proxy in this case, to divulge nothing of what I had seen and heard, and to my intense relief this seemed to satisfy the king. Nevertheless, however, from that moment forward, I was roped into his close council, and once again I found myself pulled deeper into the nebulous territory in which the roles of guest and prisoner are mixed. From this moment onwards, my fate was sealed. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome back to Rome 2 Total War with the Galatian campaign, where previously we fought a very, very sketchy battle against the Cappadocians, but ultimately triumphed, looted Mazaka, and the Cappadocians have now been destroyed. However, uh... This does place us in an interesting position because it means we now share a border with the mighty Seleucid Empire, which at the moment, as you can see, judging by this campaign diplomacy map, uh, they're not very pleased with this. They're not best pleased at all. Now, uh, I don't really super duper exactly know how to do this. Looks like Armenia also next door are not very happy with this either, by the way. Um, they have their fair share of enemies already, as it, look, as it would appear. They're at war with Pontus, Cartley, Bithynia, Ardon. The Seleucids seem to be at war with half the bloody map. They're at war with Pergamum, Parthia, the Nabataeans, Atropatkin, whoever they are, the Ptolemies, um, that's Egypt, basically, if you're not aware. Um, Asgata, Zarenka, Haralvatis. Um, the Seleucid Empire is massive, as I said. It's, it's kind of huge. Uh, stretches all the way from here, all the way out into um, the arse end of Persia. However, the thing about the Seleucid Empire is it has a lot of client kingdoms. A lot of its territory is actually made up of uh, what we'll call satrapies. And... Judging by this list of number of people they're at war with, I wouldn't be surprised at all right now if some of these satrapies... Yeah, here we go. There, it even says so right there. Strongly linked to their overlord. Consider them as close military allies when assessing the strength of this faction. I wouldn't be surprised if a number of them are actually rebelling against them currently. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, Lydia, interestingly, these guys over here, they're actually a satrapy of the Seleucids as well. That's interesting to note. So, if uh, the Seleucids come for us, yeah, Lydia will be uh, coming for us too. Wow. That's not great. But uh, we could probably count Pontus as among our allies if this all kicks off. Right now, we've got like a we've got like a huge war potentially in the making. We'd have like Armenia, the Seleucids, and Lydia on one side, 
against us and potentially Pontus, and maybe if we're lucky, we could rope Bithynia into it. If we can deal with Sinope first, perhaps. I, I am thinking that Sinope might be my next target if Bithynia can't get off its arse and do it itself. Um, but yes, the Salutes are mad at us. They're pretty darn mad at us. Now, the problem with the Seleucids and the Armenians at the moment is that I could try and buy them off with a sum of gold, kind of like we did with the Pontix. Um, there is a problem with that, though, because while the Pontix, you'll note, are reliable, the Seleucids are devious. The less reliable a faction is, the higher the chance it will turn against its allies if given the opportunity. Be wary of unreliable allies. Watch your back. Yeah... Uh, the Seleucids are devious, and even worse, the Armenians are downright treacherous. Uh, so, even if I bought them off, they are likely to just take my money, say thank you very much, and then stab me in the back anyway, even if I get a non-aggression pact with them. So I don't know what to do about the Seleucids. I'm basically just hoping maybe they'll leave me alone, because they've got enough on their plate as it is. But um, that might not end up being the case. Um, oh boy, folks, it's the Galatian experience, all right. It's uh, <laughs> it's fun. I mean, I, it's it's annoying too because I'll, I'll, I'll level with you. My ambitions lie to the west. I should like to subjugate Greece. I think I would like to do that. Succeed where King Brennus failed, and just completely subjugate the Greeks. Uh, I'm not interested in going east. I don't want to go to bloody Persia. I'm not Alexander the Great. I don't care about this, but unfortunately the Seleucids friggin' hate us. So, we might not be given a choice. On the bright side, I guess. Uh, not so much over here dealing with uh, the Lydians. They've got a few ways into our territory, but the Seleucids are going to have to come up this pass here. So, we've got a choke point there to help defend ourselves with, if necessary. Um, yeah. Are the Armenians, on the other hand, I mean, gosh, they're going to have to... I don't think they can get to us. I think they'd have to go through... Unless they can maybe go through this here. I don't know. I think they'd probably have to go through Pontus to get to us. So I don't necessarily have to worry about Armenia just now. I mean, can I path away through here at all? No, it does not like it. So yeah, the Armenians are not an immediate concern. Even though they hate us and are treacherous. Yeah. Um, in the meantime... We do have a big pile of money, but we also have the immediate problem of a negative income. Um, that will hopefully be fixed a little bit, maybe once we uh, fix up this place. Oh, I need to uh, do this again. Sorry, the, the save game isn't quite synced up with exactly where we left off last time. Um, I need to set that for dismantlement. There we go. This other building here is grain pits. I was thinking about maybe converting that to something else, but maybe we'll be okay. Um... We have minus one food on our, as our food surplus at the moment, which is a bit annoying and a bit of a problem. We can temporarily fix that, though, by doing some pol political shenanigans. Um, if we wanted to convert the grain pits, what would we convert them into? You could get a reservoir that doesn't give you any food, but it does give you growth and sanitation. Field, that gives you poor food. Um, sewage ditch, again, no food, lots of fat sanitation, though. And a public order, actually. A really huge chunk of public order, too. Um, that's interesting. Might be worth considering, actually. Well, in the future, when we expand, anyway. Right now, we've... Uh, we need to... We need we need food production. So, uh, cattle pens is another option. That would give us two food. 250 worth of agriculture. I think grain pits might be the more sensible choice for now, though. So I think we'll keep the grain pits and just repair them. Um, our income is a problem as well. Um, our tax level, I, ideally I would actually like to lower my taxes, not raise them any, any further. Public order is in the toilet. Um, and a slightly irritating feature, I'm going to be honest, about Rome 2 is the way the provinces work and public order works. In previous Total War games, you know, you'd, it, public order would be assigned to a city. Um, now public order is assigned to an entire region. So in spite of the fact that Ankyra is full of perfectly happy ga Gauls, um, they're now all really pissed off because Mazaka is pissed off. Um, and it makes no damn sense. And it is probably my chief biggest complaint with this game. Um, 
and unfortunately this system they went ahead and adopted this for pretty much every total war game going forward um it's the same in all of them pretty much uh, and it drives me bonkers i i really don't like it at all but never mind I'm not here to not here to grouse there's plenty of other things in this game to like i, I put up with this because i do like the rest of the game but uh, yes as you can see our public order is now at minus 66 per turn uh, most of that is because of con Conquest, which is next turn only. So that'll go away next turn. But that will still leave us at, like, minus 26 public order per turn. Minus 14 of that is cultural differences, which sucks. Um, yeah, well, there's no easy way around that, playing as the Galatians. It's going to be a bit like playing as the Western Roman Empire in, a, in Attila, which is going to have a constant negative culture slash religion debuff to our public order everywhere we go. Um taxes are obviously making people unhappy slaves are making people unhappy provincial instability is making people unhappy that will slowly go away at minus one per turn and military presence is actually making them quite unhappy as well that's because uh that's because magarix is actually in mazaka right now um as, as we discussed i think in the last episode although i don't know if it made the editing cut in the end um stationing billeting an army inside a town makes really pisses off the population um so we should have just enough movement points to get out of the town um that might help a little bit yes it's gone down to minus 51 now at least um we might have a rebellion we might honestly we might end up having a rebellion this is this is why um expansion is quite slow in divide tempera you have to really take it slow if you overextend you end up in a whole heap of trouble um we are potentially not going to be expanding for a little while yet depends on how things are going up here at Sinope but potentially for a while now we are going to be um, building up and getting things under control wrangling the economy back under control wrangling public order back on, under control and sorting out our food negative that we've got at the moment um, because that's just the way of things it's the problem with uh, occupying a settlement rather than just sacking it you do have to deal with all this crap unfortunately um which is presumably why the gauls did an awful lot of sacking and then leaving in real life because they didn't want to stick around and deal with all this nonsense but uh magarix has decided that mazaka is going to be added to the gallic domain and therefore unfortunately its unruly population needs to be fed and also appeased or well, brought into line more likely rather than a peace bay if we do get a rebellion it's not the end of the world it doesn't work if you're a medieval two and rome one veteran um rebellions in this don't work like they do in that game what happens is a rebel stack will form somewhere in the province and they'll be very small to start with um they'll only be like one or two units and then over the turns if you leave them alone they will continue to gather more and more rebels to them and the stack will get larger and larger and larger and eventually they'll attack you um and it means that you can, if you want to stomp them out nice and quickly early, you can just stomp them out when they've only got a few units. Um, sometimes, though, it can be beneficial to let them blob up a little bit before you wipe them out, because as long as the rebellion is gathering, the troublesome elements of the town's population are leaving town, and your public order will actually increase dramatically so long as the rebels are out in the countryside because people are the, the difficult people are all leaving to join the rebellion um means that the, the people left behind are essentially collaborators um so sometimes it can be a good idea to take advantage of that and let the rebellion build a little bit more before you come in and chop her, all their heads off that way you get more rebels in one go right um you got to think like a Roman, everybody. That's how this works, all right? You've got to be goddamn ruthless like that if you want to succeed. Um, so, yeah, we might get a rebellion. I won't... So I'm not going to cry too much about trying to get this public order under control. An easier way to get it under control, potentially, might just be to let them rebel and then murder them all. Cut off all their heads, take them back to the palace. Um, sacrifice them to the gods. You know, all that sort of stuff. So um, there's the preamble out of the way. Um, I'm pretty much ready to just hit and turn now and brace myself for whatever's going to happen next. However, there are one or two things we could do. Uh, if we go to the politics tab, um, we could... We could... 
we could try and solve our food problem. Are they getting any negatives from the lack of food at the moment? It doesn't actually look like it, weirdly enough. But um, we could try and temporarily solve the food problem and maybe soften the um, the public order a little bit by using some intrigue options. So I could, uh, for example, we could get Caxtos. Well, he can't do anything right now, actually. We could get Iparkos, for example, to organize games in the province. So Galatia and Cappadocia. He'll do that. Consequence, the games were a great success, increasing public order in the province. So that'll, you know, lower the, the deficit of public order a little bit for this turn. Um, we can also get, for example, Sakrapo to send emissary. Uh, send the politician to a province to help them with their basic necessities. Well, food at least. Uh, he'll gain some gravitas. Uh, his party will get plus five loyalty for five turns. Um costs us a chunk of money but um it will significantly help the food situation there we go people wouldn't have to worry about food so much now um so you're spending some money there to help you know deal with the food problem but you know we nicely we've got a surplus of two down the bottom there um the negative from the money the predicting in predicted income on the other hand that's that's i don't quite know how we're going to deal with that just yet um, we'll, we'll figure it out. I'm hoping, like I said, once this is repaired, that, uh, you know, it'll be... They set a dismantle, isn't it? Yeah. I'm hoping that once these are repaired, maybe the income will sort itself out a bit. I don't know. End turn. Oh, right. Magarix. For the tribe. He needs to level up. Right. Okay. So... Let's see, the Doom Pigs themselves need to level up as well, because armies gain experience in this as well, and they gain traditions. So I think... Let's see, uh, half Bear Guard. Plus 2% melee defense, plus 2% morale. Rap Rapine Plunderers. Kill the enemy, take his gold, and enjoy his women. Minus 10% attritional losses when besieging. Uh, Wolves of the North. Melee attack and morale. Let's take Wolves of the North. Let's take... Path bear guard, and we can have a third, which I guess we'll take. Formidable spearmen, because most of our army is spearmen. Nice. So a few little bonuses there to morale and whatnot. Any morale bonuses I will absolutely take, because my god, we need them. Um, let's see. Uh, now, yeah, Magarix himself can gain some skills now at this point. Let's see. Um... I think Rightful Sovereign would be a good place to start. Plus two public order for local province. Plus one authority, minus three boundary. Allows for the improvement of the intellectual character trait, which is this one here. Um, so we'll take Rightful Sovereign. Potentially one of these as well in the blue category in addition to that. Um, political Animal, Master of Statecraft... Ooh, minus 20% public order penalties due to local presence of foreign cultures. Local province. That would be helpful, particularly as this faction we're playing as. Unwavering Patriot. That does the opposite. Downside does give us minus one cultural conversion for local province. Minded bonus to diplomacy with all factions. Cultural affinity action. Why, that would help. That'd be nice. It's a minor bonus, but it's something. Patron of the military. Uh, also, minus 5% unit recruitment cost. Oh, I thought it's, a, no, it's minus 3% upkeep for all land units. Uh, you know what? I like Master of Statecraft. I also like Patron of the military. Mm, I'm going to go with Master of Statecraft for now. This, I don't, the minus 1 cultural conversion isn't like, I'm, I'm not so keen on that, but this somehow feels right for the story of this campaign so far so let's go with that and that's actually reduced the public order negative quite a bit which is handy all right well now we can end turn I've spent nearly 20 minutes just sat here talking at the campaign map. I hope that's not a problem for people. 
Things are going to get... I mean, we got one... I managed to squeeze a battle into episode one of this campaign. I couldn't begin to tell you when our next one will actually be, I'm afraid, unless I have to slaughter some rebels. Um, as I said, slow-paced gameplay on this. Um, and Div Dividea Impera encourages slow-paced gameplay as well. It, you really want to build tall in DEI uh, and expand slowly if you want to succeed. So... Uh, can't promise this is going to be a super action-packed episode. Give careful thought to this offer. My people expect acceptance, and if Athena helps you, they may have it. Okay, so Bithynia wants military access. They're demanding 480 gold from me for the privilege. Um, I guess I'm inclined to do it just just to boost our, you know, relations. 480 is pocket change to me right now. We have currently a trade agreement and a non-aggression pact with them. Why not add military access to it? Sure. Cheeky of them to try and get a, squeeze a bit of money out of me for it, but... I think that's a... We'll call that an investment, shall, shall we? We'll call it an investment in the future. All right. The need for cavalry. Despite your undoubted military might, some have drawn attention to the fact that your cavalry lacks strength and numbers. Rally horsemen. Um, the promise of glory, lands, and titles will help draw many horsemen to your cause, which will give us cavalry recruitment for four turns. A focus on cavalry warfare is reducing the cost of recruiting mounted units by 25%. So I uh, caught a discount on recruiting cavalry, or the alternative is plus two experience ranks for new cavalry units. I'm not recruiting any more damn cavalry at the moment. We, we're at the very limit of our budget as it is. So whatever. Cavalry training, I guess. Magna Graecia secured. Uh, now that Rome is no longer at war in southern Italy, the uneasy peace between Carthage and Rome has become frayed. Should Rome seek to assert her influence into Sicily... Carthage will take that as a sign of war. So it sounds like the Romans have secured southern Italy. They've kicked out what remained of uh, Pyrrhus of Ep Epirus's forces in around Tarentum. And now, yeah, they're probably going to be arming up for a tussle with Carthage over Sicily. The first Punic War on the horizon. Celtic field systems. Right, our tech up is done. And Hipparchus has returned from his little mission, Sosacrapo. Lovely. So yeah, if we hop on over here, you can't see very much really, can you, through all the fog? But uh, yeah, the Romans have secured southern Italy and they'll be wanting to go into Sicily pretty soon. And then they'll be fighting with Carthage. Interesting to note, actually. Rome and Carthage, um, at this pr just prior to this period, they, um, they are actually fairly close-ish allies. They had a sort of unofficial alliance against Pyrrhus their common enemy because Pyrrhus had ambitions in Sicily and he actually kicked the ass of the Carthaginians quite a bit um, while he was there um, and Epirus, Pyrrhus of Epirus, Epirus being over here um, he decided to make an enemy of the Romans and the Carthaginians and the Romans and the Carthaginians kind of they didn't totally team up against Epirus but they had a sort of agreement that they would come to each other's aid in order to help defeat Pyrrhus if it became necessary like the Carthaginians had basically made their navy available to the Romans if they had to and so on and so forth and obviously that 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 little piece that little alliance there didn't last very long in the long run did it um as we all know Ready for orders. um Preto I'm thinking I'm having might have you leave the army and do something more useful Counterintelligence establishes local spy network, improving the chance of detecting hidden agents and armies within in the area whilst protecting local settlements from agent actions. That's not super useful, but you'll gain some experience doing it, so fine. I was hoping you might be able to do something to help with public order, perhaps. Although public order now is back up to plus eight a turn. Marvellous. That is mostly thanks to events and characters. Although I'm getting a plus five from difficulty level, which is nice, I guess. I'm only playing on normal, but uh, apparently that gives me a plus five, which helps ca cancel out that awful cultural differences penalty we have to deal with all the time. Still. Okay, we turned public order around pretty swiftly, didn't we? Right, what do we want to put in this construction? Okay, right, eastern village. That needs to be converted to a barbarian village, apparently. Um, 
That's going to cost us a chunk. The grain pits need to con be converted. We can't keep those, apparently. Uh, all right. Um, what should we convert them to? Because we need food income. That's 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 definitely a thing. Although we don't actually have a negative at the moment. Interestingly, but whatever. Um, maybe we had the negative because the army was in town earlier. I don't know. Little subtleties like that escape me at times, you know. Why don't we convert this into? I think we should probably ought to convert this into fields, maybe. It's tempting to go with uh, with the sewage ditch for the public order bonus, but I feel like fields is the best life choice. Yep, convert it into fields, and the new and this fret spare construction site. What do I want to do? Sacred enclosure plus two sanitation region plus two Celtic cultural influence. That's not bad. Greek immigrants. A welcoming place for the local people. Hmm. Plus two growth per turn, 60 wealth from local commerce, 500 cost to dismantle, diplomatic bonus with Hellenic factions, plus two Hellenic cultural influence. Here. Um, traders field. More growth, more public order. And population growth for second class citizens. Iron mine? Iron mine. Ooh. That's a local resource, the iron. That's probably important. I feel like that might be what we should go with. Yeah, let's, yeah, let's go with the iron mine. 10 iron a turn. Or a turn, I'm not sure. 150 wealth for mining. Yeah, let's go with the iron mine. Iron's very important. Iron's good to have. It's unique to that settlement in particular, that iron mine, so I feel like we ought to exploit it. Uh, tech. Let's have a look. Iron tools. Enables building farm. It's level 3. Fields type building. Uh, knowledge of the oak. Hmm. Plus 5% wealth from culture. Minus 20% political action cost. That would be nice. They do a lot of political actions after all. Save a bit of money. Earthworks. There's also military ones available. Headhunt. Hmm. Shadow kill. Oh, we're not going to be doing anything with ships for ages. Uh, warrior code. More dance. That's also tempting, actually. It's a nice bonus to our troops' stats. I think I'm going to get Knowledge of the Oak to reduce our political action costs. A 20% discount on those is nice, so we'll do that. And uh, for now... Man, yeah, they do not like us at all, do they? <laughs> oh, that they seriously hate us, actually, the Armenians, even more so than the Seleucids. Um, yeah. I'm going to... I'm going to just take it easy for a while, folks. I'm going to build things up, get 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 life here in Galatia under control a little bit. Uh, we're in the positive or predicting, predicted income, at least for now. Um, I think I'll return to you when something interesting of note is going on. Well, this is nice. Feast. I think a lot of factions get an event like this, actually, I've, I've noticed. Um from playing other campaigns. Well, this is pretty cool. Some very nice historical info about Celtic feasts and stuff. Seasonal rites were a sacred feature of barbarian life. The Celts, for example, observed four major festivals in the year. Imbolc, Beltane, oh god, Lurknesag, and Samain. Uh, these milestones in the agricultural calendar marked the passage of the seasons, and similar celebrations were observed across many tribal civilizations in one form or another. Such festivals offered thanks for the bounty of the land and anticipated the season ahead. Festivities signifying the beginning of winter were perhaps the most important, marking the dark half of the year. The cattle were brought down from their summer grazing in the high meadows and the appropriate animals were chosen for slaughter. Fires were lit to guard against the coming darkness. The animals were slaughtered and an almighty feast would follow. Uh, we get uh, 
15% plus 15% wealth from agriculture and plus four public order per turn, which is neat. Uh, yes, very interesting. Um, what we know about the Celtic calendar comes from Roman era calendars that have actually been, you know, found as archaeological finds. Um, there's one in, example in particular I'm thinking of that was recovered from somewhere in France around uh, sort of around Aquitaine, somewhere around down, around down there. Um, and it was a a Celtic calendar that was printed on bronze or copper or something like that. It was sort of engraved on there in sheets and it had the whole Celtic calendar on there with all the various festivities and things like that as well as days specifically marked on the calendar that were either considered to be auspicious or inauspicious. Um, and one of the interesting thing we've learned from it is that uh, they had a, a I think they, the Celtic year lasted 354 days but there was an interesting sort of liminal period of, of time in between the two years, at the end of one year and the beginning of the next one. Um, no, By no means unique among other cultures across the world, but it, it, it was a, a thing in the Celtic tradition whereby there was this weird in-between period um, between the two years, which was considered to be very spooky and... Uh, um, and weird because that's when the gods came out to play and stuff like that and uh, it's all pretty interesting stuff really um, but the calendar in particular that I'm thinking of though was recovered from somewhere in France and I think it dates back to sort of like the first century AD so long after the, Gaul, the Romans had conquered Gaul but a lot of these traditions stuck around for a very very long time afterwards um, they weren't completely eradicated anyway Nice historical info. Just thought I'd interrupt the video to bring you that. Nothing else of interest has really happened. Apparently, the Absinthioi have, have arisen. Presumably as a result of a rebellion somewhere. Uh, aside from that, nothing particularly interesting going on. It's uh, December, which is considered autumn, interestingly enough. Um, and nothing else of interest appears to really be happening. I think I was just going to... I recall. I was just going to set... Uh, Magarix to patrol. Faster, damn you all. And I think we're going to do the same with uh, with you, sir. Just set you on patrol stance for now. Which I think maybe helps boost income a little bit, but uh, also helps boost public order quite significantly. We're now on plus 21 a turn, so we've really turned that around. That's good to see. Hopefully we cheer up the local population at the moment. They are indifferent. Uh, we'd like them to be a little bit more than indifferent, though. We'd like them to be quite happy, because it'll boost growth and tax income and things like that, I think. Anyway, I'll be back. We've been contacted by the Kingdom of Pergamon, everybody. They would like 120 gold from us in exchange for a non-aggression pact. In the long term, I would like to crush Pergamon. I would like to crush them into dust and take all of their valuables and lands for ourselves because historically Pergamon kicked the crap out of the Galatians and I would like to reverse this historical injustice over the course of this campaign in an ideal world. In the short term, however, I don't think we can really afford to be picky um, because we have the Seleucids, Armenia and Lydia to contend with and none of them like us very much. So we need to take friends where we can find them. So yes, I will do that. You can have your ch pocket change in exchange for a non-aggression pact. And hopefully... By the Tetractis, you have a good mind in your skull. <laughs> your decision here is most excellent. Good, thank you. Yeah, we'll, 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 we'll court your favour for now, Pergamon. Um, I'd also like to sort of get in touch with the Ptolemies, who I think have a bit of land down in the southwest corner of, uh, of Anatolia. Because um, they would be a huge ally to have on our side, the Egyptians. Um, they would be a massive ally. They are, they are pretty much the Seleucids' major rival in, uh, in the east here. And having them on our side would be in tremendously helpful, really. Uh, not necessarily an alliance with them, because I don't want to get dragged into anything, but having them friendly towards us would be very, very good. Um, Oh, they want, the game wanted me to recruit a champion, and I was just like, no, I don't need a champion, and also I'd have to pay him a salary, so I'm not going to do it right now. Um, Preto's increased in rank. That's nice. Uh, let's see what I want to do with you, Preto. Sabotage, murder. I don't, an assassinate never seems to really work. I'm not, I'm not huge keen on going into that. Collaboration, on the other hand. Let's get that. Let's get... 
Disruption, maybe. Spy. I upgrade this cunning. Let's take that. And reconnaissance. Furtiveness. Let's take reconnaissance. That would help when he's attached to the army. All right, cool. Preto's leveled up. Very nice. Um, anyway, yeah, I'd like to go in. In fact, they, there they go. They control Cedo down there. So, Preto, go and say hello to the Ptolemies for me. Because I don't know if we can actually talk to them right now. Oh, I think we can. I think we can. They're, they're a, bit, a little neutral with us right now, but... Your embassy is most welcome. I listen most carefully as the servant of Pharaoh. Lord of the two houses. Very good. Hello. Nice to meet you, Ptolemy. Um, I'd like to be your friend. I can't trade with you at the moment because we're just, yeah, landlocked. It's a pain. I'd really like access to the sea. One more reason for us to swoop in and maybe take out Sinope, get access to the Black Sea. Um, however, would a non-aggression pact suit you? Apparently the chance is moderate. If I were to throw in just a little bit of cash on the side... Just a small tribute, a little, a, a token of our uh, sincerity. Of course not. You ask much of Pharaoh, Lord of All, in seeking a treaty. He is not generous today. <sighs> Why are you gonna be like that, guys? Come on. Oh, we're gonna be here all day, are we? Haggling over this, for goodness sake. But for now, Pharaoh, shield of his people. Sees no yeah. need for such agreement. Oh, really, dude? Come on, you're going to be exactly like the Pontics Lord about this, aren't you? Four thousand. They could be. You are being completely unreasonable, sir. All right. How about I simply give you a gift? Seven hundred. A gift. There you go. A gift to get us off on the right foot, if nothing else. Mother of God. So much for chance moderate. Maybe I'll try again next turn and see if we have any more luck. But yes, chance moderate my ass. I don't know. Goodness me. I don't know. Uh, you know what? Preto, let's have you explore a little bit more over in that direction. Actually, arguably, I should send him back in this direction to try and scout the Seleucids out a bit. So, um, yeah, I changed my mind. You can go this way instead. <laughs> anyway. Ah, uh, you, you're just... I mean, you're the only thing you've got going for you, Ptolemy, is the fact that you're only slightly less unreasonable than the Seleucids. I'm gonna do some politics, ladies and gentlemen. Um, the date is currently February of 277 BC. According to the year in history, uh, only now did the, uh, the Gauls gain control of a large area in Asia Minor, so I knew the timeline was a bit squiffy. But I'm still not convinced it was 277 BC. I mean, the, 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 the information I have read in books on the subject, it suggests that the Gauls didn't actually really properly settle around Ancyra until, like, the 260s BC? Like, 266 is a, is, a, is a date that pops into my mind unbidden for some reason. I think it was the 260s where they, they actually really settled down, but... Oh, well. I don't know enough to actually say for sure. Either way, 278 BC is a bit early for, to be starting a Galatian campaign in theory, but as we've discovered... Well, as I've said... Uh, it's smudged a bit for gameplay purposes. Um, Magarix is back home. Well, he's not yet. He's travelling, as you can see currently. I decided to put um, Iparkos... Sorry, not Parkos, Sokrapo, um, as caretaker for the army. He's doing, he's patrolling around Mazaka at the moment with the with the uh, with the warriors, keeping order. At the moment, uh, Magarix himself is back off to Ankyra to his palace. Um, he his stats have increased significantly lately. He's got six authority now, six zeal. Part of that is because he's got an interesting new item, a dried heart. Plus two authority, plus two zeal, plus eight morale for the commander's unit. Not bad, not bad at all. Interesting that he's got he's got a severed head, a quick limed head, very nice. But he also has this heart now. Interesting that really, honestly, because I don't recall ever reading anything about the Celts taking hearts as trophies. Heads definitely, they have had a really big thing about heads. Hearts though, bit weird, little bit unusual that, as far as I'm aware. Nevertheless, though, bloody great stats. He's also still got his Master of Horse and his Crisis Manager. And his Harrod and Wife. Speaking of his Harrod and Wife, though, um, we're going to have a secure promotion. 
Um, she is. You have career levels, you see here. Um, Magritte isn't beholden to that because he's the faction leader. But some of these other guys have them as well. He's currently a noble, for example. Same with you. Same with you. Um, we'd like Melina to get herself a little promotion, though. She can go from being, or well, she can go from what she, whatever she's at the minute to being an influential woman. She gives us plus three percent wealth from entertainment, culture, or region, regions. I don't think we have anything that's producing entertainment wealth, but um, sure, whatever. Plus one gravitas per turn. Plus two loyalty for our party, and not that that matters. Although minus two loyalty for other parties for two turns, but they are very loyal at the moment. So there we go. She's now an influential woman. Very nice. She could secure promotion again, actually, if we wanted to. Increases your gravitas income per turn, obviously, which is nice. Um, not as useful on her with only your ambition one, but hey could on the other hand try and gather more support how much did that cost us 374 sure it's quite cheap actually do that a couple more times actually are we we are now admired excellent so that's nice bonuses there we go that's what i was looking for um my promoter again actually as well no um, or not no i will leave it alone for now We'll, we'll leave it for now. Um, let's not push it. Send a gift. She could send a gift to one of these guys in order to, uh, in order to butcher him up a bit. Cactus, I'm thinking maybe his loyalty is looking a little on the lower side right now. Not not low enough. We really realistically need to worry about it at all. But hey, why not keep it under control if you can? Send a gift. Four hundred and four. Do a favor. It would cost you gravitas to do that. Plus one authority for targeted own party member. Plus five gravitas for other party member. She could give a gift to one of these guys, I guess. Oh, sorry, do a favor for Send a gift. Send a gift to Kakstos for his service lately. Sure. There we go. They were pleased by our contribution. She's... Organized a gift on behalf of the king for Kaxtos in order to keep him a little happier. Nice. Oh, she can actually take advantage of the Medicus or the uh, the quick climbed head, hilariously enough, although she won't get a huge amount of use out of them. She'll get the plus one zeal, I guess. So there you go. She can have an extra point of zeal, but she's, there's no point in her having a Medicus because she ain't, she ain't leading any armies. I think some factions it is possible to have female characters lead armies, but I don't know if that's possible with us. Certainly when I go to, you know, raise an army or something like that, I, uh, she's not available in the list, so. It's sort of an interesting thing there, actually. What's that? Personal tutor. Ah, this is, this is, uh, Sokrapos. One of his household items, personal tutor, plus one cunning, plus one gravitas per turn. I could remove it from him, but I don't, I think that would be a little too cheesy, honestly, just taking household sort of ancillaries away from other characters of other parties and just giving them to mine. It just feels wrong somehow. I don't, I don't think, I think that would cause offense, you know, if King Magrex walked in and said, Sokrapo, your personal tutor, he's mine now, deal with it. I don't think he'd be very happy about that, realistically. So I'm not going to do that. I'm going to let him keep that. I'm not going to take it away from him, even though that would be the uh, the best thing to do purely in gameplay terms. Remember, I did say we'd be role-playing this a little bit as much as possible. Anyway. All right, folks. Slightly significant political development here. Armenia is now at war with the Seleucids. I guess that's what the Seleucids get for having an ally who's treacherous. In retrospect, probably should have seen that coming. Uh, yeah, the Seleucids are now at war with uh, at war with Armenia, which is great news for us, as far as I can tell. Particularly excellent news for Pontus, I think. Um, the Seleucids are at war with an increasingly large number of people these days. Um, <laughs> oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. I still haven't made any progress trying to butter up the Ptolemies, by the way. Minus one attitude to us. Strength and wisdom be his. The likelihood of success for a non-aggression pact is currently low. That all is within his divine hearing. 
until until we can trade with them, I don't think we're going to make any progress uh, making the getting the Ptolemies to like us unless we start taking a action against the people that they don't like. I think if we were to do some agent shenanigans against Lydia, perhaps they would potentially like us more as a result of that. However, however, I don't necessarily want to piss off Lydia because they're allies with the Seleucids. At least for now they are anyway. Uh, maybe I should check actually. <laughs> the Seleucid diplomatic situation is constantly changing. They, they remain a satrapy of the Seleucids at the moment. For, for now, they haven't decided to declare war just yet. But boy, if they do, oh, everyone's going to be picking apart the Seleucid corpse if this keeps up, and I like it. I think we're going to keep having Preto investigate what's going on over the border over there. We've got a Seleucid army in Antioch here. Uh, Chalcaspides, Greek bronze shield pikemen. Yeah, these are the guys I'm really afraid of, as the Gauls, honestly. Some early royal guard cavalry. Some very heavy infantry, man. They just their army is no joke. They, their stuff is just so much better than ours at this juncture. At least it will be until I manage to get this uh, meeting ground set up, and then it'll, that'll unlock a huge array of new units um, that may help to balance the scales a bit at the moment. Because our, our, our army kind of sucks at the moment. It's basically just a bunch of dudes in trousers with spears. That'll change though eventually. In the meantime, they're going to keep snooping around to see what the Seleucids are up to. And uh, keep building, really. We're still waiting for a lot of stuff to finish building at the moment, particularly in Mazarka. Um, on the bright side, po population is happy. Um, in other news, uh, we've finished our research. I need to select some new research. And uh, do, 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 do. tensions in Sicily. Carthage is getting the upper hand in Sicily on its way to complete control of the, of the island. Carthage has angered Roman interest in the area. So yeah, first Punic War, very much on the way, it looks like. Uh, but that's all for now, folks. It's the spring of... Uh, well, April specifically of the spring of 277 BC, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, the local chieftain detests you. He curses your ambitions, your military might, and mocks your manhood. He makes it known to all that he should stand in your place. We can try and bribe him to our side. We can try to discredit him. We can assassinate him. We can do nothing. Let the fool blather. Now, I think in Celtic, Celtic culture, from what we know about it, actually, the uh, Magrigs would not be able to afford to um, let this slide. He would have to kill the man, probably in single combat, um, for an insult like that. However, that's not really an option, unfortunately, here. Um, I like the idea, though, of Melina just deciding, right, this guy's going to die. Poisoning his wine or something, so we'll try and assassinate him. Might not be the brightest idea, this, actually. But um, trying to discredit, or maybe just leaving him alone completely, might be the best idea. But uh, I think Melina is going to try and assassinate him. She's going to have him poisoned, perhaps, I think. We won't we won't find out how that turn shakes out until next turn, I think. Um, Magarix has a few interesting options here. He's got praise. Spread compliments about a friend or rival. Uh, plus 10 gravitas for target. Plus 1 zeal for target. Plus 3 loyalty for target party. And provoke. Minus 1 cunning for target. Boost political instant occurrence for the next 4 turns. If he's not a member of another party, minus 3 loyalty. Interesting. Don't need to see the need to provoke anyone right now, but hey. Leisure time is an option. Take a break from politics on a deserved vacation. Plus one cunning for the target. Plus five gravitas per turn. For one turn. Requires six zeal and six authority. Uh, Magrix is going to take a step back from politics for a little while. Just going to let, let Melina handle things, I think, at the, old, at the old palace for a little while. He's going to go on a hunting expedition, I think. Let's do that. The character is now on vacation. Um... Yeah, let's do that. Upgrade is cunning, I think, if we do that. So, very nice. Uh, anything else to address in the meantime? Let me look at the events here. I don't think so. Oh, yes, there was one, thing, one small thing. Preto, our scout, now has a pet guard dog. Plus one zeal, plus 10% chance of wounding enemy agents in self-defense. Uh, Preto now has a good doggo companion. I thought that might be of interest to 
some of you. So, uh, important dog related updates. Hello, Armenia. You've got like a little tiny token army back home at the moment, haven't you? Armenian noble cataphracts. Oh, that is a nasty looking unit. Cataphracts. Oh. Cataphracts. What are you. Oh, hello, Pontus. You seem to be getting the upper hand right now against the Armenians, by the looks of things. Interesting. Well, good for you, I guess. I'd, in an ideal world, I'd like Pontus to take all of this. I'd like to have a friend to the east while I expand to the west. That's how I'd like this to shake out. I'd like Pontus to just gobble all this up. Pontus can have the east, I will have the west. Uh, I doubt it'll go quite that according to that plan, though. And the thing never, never really seems to, does it? Well, here's the result of that assassination. The chieftain was slain, but the blame was laid at your feet. Although no one dares challenge you directly, whispers of murder are following your wake. Should have just challenged him to a duel, but uh, that wasn't an option, really, unfortunately. Might have backfired a bit. I don't really know what the influence minus 12 tribal chiefs. I don't really know what that actually friggin' means, to be honest with you. If I, <laughs> if I click zoom to location, it just takes us all the way to the edge of the map. Um, what does that mean, influence minus 12? Maybe it means on here. Ah, I see. Yes, that's what it means. Tribal chiefs. Our equivalent of senators. Minus 12 out of 723 of 1200. Okay, we can probably live with that then. That's fine. We've still got admired as our current level of influence. Really squeezing the council of chieftains, aren't we, at the minute? The tallest of bogey are doing alright for themselves as well. They're squeezing the trock me at the moment, it looks like to me. Um, they're looking quite influential at the moment. Um, I'd like to keep pushing this though, slowly, over time, uh, until we can get to Beloved. Beloved is our is, is our ideal zone, that's where we want to be, um, ultimately. By the way, you can change your government type in this game, I don't know if I mentioned this before, but you can totally do that. We're a chieftain at the moment, it has a bunch of effects, you can also change to a tribal confederation or an empire. Cost a lot of money to do it, 20 grand. And uh, minus 30 public order faction wide, decaying by three per turn, and minus 30 loyalty for all parties, decaying by three per turn. So, uh, if you want to become an empire, um, not really, I suppose not that relevant to us, but I mean, if, if you were playing as Rome, for example, and you wanted to become an empire, yeah, civil war o'clock, basically. <laughs> uh, pretty much. Uh, it is. It, they do have some interesting bonuses, though, either way. Uh, funny thing is, though, when you start the game, for a number of turns, you are protected from civil war and secession. We've got five turns of that protection remaining right now. Uh, so it is interesting, and you often start the campaign with enough money to actually make a change to this right off the bat if you want to. I did start a Rome campaign once in this, just, just out of pure curiosity, and discovered that I could immediately change to kingdom in turn one and had enough money to do that, and it didn't matter that I lost a load of um, loyalty because you're protected from civil war. So, weirdly, you can start a Rome campaign and just decide Rome's a kingdom now and have no negative, real, real negative consequences for that. It's a little strange, but uh, never mind. Uh, regardless, that's a thing. I uh, didn't know if I'd mentioned that before. In fact, I'm pretty sure I didn't. So politics. Anything else worth mentioning? Everybody's loyalty's fine with everybody at the moment. We're, we all seem to be good. Um, one action you can do here if you're in really in trouble with so with a party and their loyalty, you can do secure loyalty and you basically just hand out some bribes to keep them on side, plus 10 loyalty for the target party for 5 turns. You can also do purge. Never done this before myself actually, but an organised massacre of all who support this party up to minus 4 influence for the target party. Minus 20 loyalty for them for 10 turns. And minus 10 for all the other parties for 5 turns. I'm not entirely sure in what circumstance you would be so desperate that you want to purge um, another party. I suppose, again, if you wanted to be a cheese ball about it, you could do that at the very start of the campaign while you're still protected. Um, but uh, I'd rather not. But that's a thing you can do, I guess. I guess if you really wanted to provoke a civil war. That's one way to do it, huh? <laughs> Just start stabbing people. <laughs> That'll be the trick. Oh, I've just decided as well. Um, we're going to recruit a chieftain. Uh, I'm not going to recruit this one because he's called Magarix, and that's just confusing. There's Carvilios, 
his bonus is three minus three percent land recruitment cost. Local province, bit rubbish. This guy though, ad. Oh my goodness me, ad cobrutatis, ad cobrutatis, ad cobrutatis. Say that a couple of times. Figure it out in my head. Ad cobrutatis. Um. He does plus three percent tax rate in the local province while deployed. Plus one cultural conversion, and. Uh, is a thing if you've got a government edict in place, but we don't have access to that right now. Uh, I'm going to recruit him. I'm called Brutatus. A merry meeting. How can I help? A Honor local chieftain who's going to be a, one of our agents in this area. Um, we can deploy him. Administration advises local officials, thereby increasing tax tax rates while helping protect local settlements against authoritarian agent actions. I can also attach him to an army to help oversee the military which actually reduces the upkeep cost of your army by a significant chunk, which is helpful too. Just thought it was probably about time we got picked up one of these guys. Could also get a war maiden at some point, a champion, in other words, but I don't really need one right now, and I'd rather not pay for it, so... Yeah. Um, this guy, though, Ad Cobrutatis. He's joined us. He's an elder. Long years bring the wisdom to listen when others speak. He's circumspect, cautious, disciplined, and abstemious. Interesting. And unjust. Ooh. Minus three public order per turn, local province. That's unhelpful. That's very unhelpful. Never mind. We're only at plus two public order at the moment in this place. Cultural differences are being a problem. Culture states at the moment is we're 25, just over a quarter Celtic at the moment. Hellenic and Persian are both going down by, by quite a chunk. So um, we're on our way to slowly making Celts of these people, but it is taking a long time. Hearthkeeper. This woman has proven herself quite capable of organizing labor in her family's large household. She is stern, but effective, and their farms are prospering. We could employ her to help plan our agricultural developments. Alternatively, we could delegate that issue to the clan leaders and perhaps gain their favour. So we could refuse, gain political favour, or hire this important character. I'm going to hire her. Rolling protection expiring. Yes, uh, three more turns and we won't have protection from secessional civil war. Not that I think we're really worried about that for the meantime. We seem to be keeping everybody relatively happy. Sinope have been destroyed. I think it looks like... Uh, yes, Bithynia finally got the job done. They've taken out Sinope. Saved me the job, I suppose. Mamlakat Himyar have been destroyed as well. That must be a, a very eastern faction of some description. Um, and Epiros have been completely destroyed! Oh my god! Rome must be on the rampage. Either Rome or Macedonia, I'm not sure which. But uh, Epirus are completely dead. Wow. I, I, I assume it was the Romans who took him out. Because they do start at war with him, I think. But uh, goodness me. Okay. Whoa. <laughs> uh, I like seeing a powerful Rome, though, in uh, in this game. It's, it's good to see. You know, you want that experience of Rome being this horrible monster that's coming to get you sooner or later over the course of a campaign when you're not playing as them. Uh, you you kind of you want that experience ultimately, don't you? You want you want to be able to take on Rome eventually, but uh, yeah, not much else going on for now. Um, let's move you back over this way. I'm still scouting out here with Preto. He's still journeying across um, the Seleucid Empire at the moment, trying to keep an eye on what's going on. Hello, there's a big army. They've got some Babylonian heavy spearmen with them, apparently. Interesting. Mesopotamian hired heavy cavalry. Yeah, lots of regional units here. Interesting. Mesopotamian hired archers. Cool. Eutukes. The general. The companion cavalry. Very good unit. Interesting. Eutukes. That's him right there with the glorious beard. Um. Hmm. Wonder what you're doing. You off to fight Pontus, perhaps? I'm not sure. Armenia has been pretty much split in half. They've got one province here, and I think another one up this way somewhere. There it is, Tushpa. Uh. So Pontus is kicking Armenia's ass at the moment. Though 
you're at war with Armenia, aren't you? So yeah, actually, you're, pr you're probably off here to, uh, over this way to try and take out Samosata. As the Armenians are eaten alive between Pontus and the Seleucids. Being rewarded for their treachery, I guess. Very nice. I did actually send uh, Kaxos over here to sort of have a little peek over the border at what was going on in Sinope. But um, we know what's going on there now. They've been taken out. Be back on patrol mode. So that's about all there is to say. It's starting to look like Lydia might be our next rivals. They certainly are our regional rivals. Problem is Lydia have the protection of the Seleucids. Which makes exp any further expansion at this point very difficult for us. Might have to pick a fight with the Seleucids ultimately. Honestly, I don't like the idea of that even a tiny, tiny bit. But it might have to happen unless Lydia breaks off from them. Which I'd really love it if they did. Um, having absolutely no luck with the Ptolemies still. There's nothing budging with them for the moment, unfortunately. But uh, never mind. That's about all there is to add. It is, uh, it is July of 277 BC. And not a whole lot is going on, really. Uh, there's one th I guess we can have a look at this lady we've acquired. In our other nobles category for our, for our faction. There she is. Akitawones. Akitawones. I've pronounced that one a few times and all. She got much ambition? Not really. Magrix. I'm going to give you the Sycophant. Because he gives you plus one Gravitas per turn. And while you're not leading an army, that would be helpful. So I'll trade that out for your Master of Horse for the moment. You... You're not going to be helped by either of those. So what does she like then? Influential woman. Agriculture specialist. Plus one wealth from agriculture or regions. Thoughtful. Education and upbringing are the foundations of character. Plus 5% civil research rate. Faction wide. Not bad. Plus one gravitas per turn. Calm. Abstemious, confident, brave and generous. Much like Melina. You can see these two either hating each other or getting on for along famously. <laughs> Difficult to say which. <laughs> either way, though, she's uh, something of a help to us. She'll be generating even more gravitas for our our lot, uh, providing a few other bonuses. Not bad. She's not married currently. Um, I don't know if we'll be able to find a spouse for her or, or what, but uh, whatever. She's with us now. She can do political actions and things. She generates gravitas for us. It's all good. It's all good. Magrix is now sitting on 116. And his wife is still has, still has more gravitas than him, but uh, he is catching up at least. <laughs> uh, if we have a look at the politics summary. Uh, we've actually gone down back down again to respected rather than admired. Well, that won't do, will it? That won't do at all. Melina, you know what to do. There we go. Keep these bastards in line. I might even do it again, actually. There we go. That'll show them. That's put us a bit of a buffer zone there, hasn't it? Um, very good. I can get it promoted again as well, actually. Let's do it. Let's get greedy. Nice. She is now an opportunistic woman. Very good. And you guys probably didn't like that, but uh, you're not openly mad at me yet, so that's okay. That'll do. All right. The turns roll on, everybody. Nothing much doing at the moment. Still building things up. I'm in the mo process of halfway through building an ironworks at the moment in Mazaka. Gives us 10 iron, 300 wealth for manufacturing, plus one banditry, although we can counteract that very easily. Um, and a bit of 0.3% second class citizen and 0.1% foreigner population um, as well. So a bit of population growth into the bargain. Um, we've got our meeting ground. Ready for orders. If I were to take you out of that and go to recruit units, let's see what we've got available to us now. We've got Talista Bogioi Ambaktoi, Galatian Chosen Swordsman. Very nice. Melee attack 16, defense 13, charge bonus 22, weapon damage is very high, good armor as well. I guess I guess Bogiokingetoi, Galatian Axeman. Um... 
also quite nice. Lots of AP damage with Axemen, right? Isn't that, isn't that a thing? Yes. Good unit to use against enemy heavily armoured units, which we might run into quite a lot of, actually, if we start fighting Greeks. Tectosiges Ueragris. Um, Galatian Swordsman. Basically the equivalent of the Spearmen, I guess, but they've got swords. Still got the guy Sartes. Cappadocioi Haploi. These are Cappadocian levies. It's an area of recruitment unit. It's got a little banner icon on the bottom left there. Um, another brilliant, amazing feature of Divideat Imperi is area, the area of recruitment system, which allows you to recruit auxiliary units um, all over the map from the regions you conquer. Um, it's great. It's a, it's a great feature. Honestly, it really is. It's fantastic. A lot of people treat it almost like Pokemon. They like to go collect all of the different AOR units all over the map that they can possibly recruit. So we can recruit those guys. I don't know if they're actually that good. They're probably, they're very cheap. 66 upkeep. Very, very, very cheap. It's probably about the only thing they've got going for them, though. Our Galatian Light Spearmen are better than they are. Which is saying something. Uh, anything else new? No, not really. Still, we've got access to some very nice units. Of course, it's worth bearing in mind. The better ones do recruit from the higher echelons of society. For example... These uh, Galatian Chosen Swordsmen, they cost 200 Equites, and we have only 914 Equites available in our population, so we can't recruit a lot of these guys, but they are very good. Um, the Axemen, noticeably better. Still relatively good armor, actually. Uh, pretty decent morale. Um... Yeah, they're not bad. Not in the same class, even remotely, but, you know, they're not bad. And, uh... They, they, they recruit from the, um, the guy Sate. Echelon of the population, so, of which we have 3,450. Which is still not a huge amount, but it's significantly more than the Equites. Um... Equites essentially being knights, I think, in this, in this sort of context. That's effectively what it translates to. It's our knights... Um, yeah, these guys recruit from 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 the lower echelons, so that we can get loads of them if we want to. You guys, you recruit from the bottom, absolute bottom of the bottom tier. You do the Wowler. If we look on here, the Wowler, yeah, they're, they're the absolute bottom. They're the foreigner population essentially which is growing at the moment you may have noticed but pretty much all of them are decreasing we've got population going down across the board at the moment possibly a little bit concerning why is that then so look at the breakdown why is every why is my population shrinking um overcrowding base slash base growth that's obviously having an effect region majority culture ah uh -huh. yes that's probably not helping either this is a good old majority culture problem biting me in the ass again. Oh, and look, we're at minus two public order right now. Probably because you stopped patrolling, am I right? Yeah, there we go. That's got it back up to plus two. Goddamn culture penalties. It is increasing, though. We're at 28% Celtic now, which is nice. It's taken a bloody while, though. Yeah, we're a little stuck at the moment. I don't really know what to do. I don't know what our next move is going to be really we've got our pals bithynia we've got our pals pontus and then we've got lydia and the seleucids which come as a package in terms of if you want to fight one of them you have to fight the other one too which is a pain yeah i almost wish i almost wish the bithynians hadn't taken Sinope there and could have had it for myself but never mind never mind with Roman armies marching into Sicily, the relationship between Rome and Carthage has deteriorated into open warfare. Carthage will respond by quickly mustering a force of their own to repel the Roman expedition. A whole Punic Wars be happening. Protections expired were no uh, longer protected from a succession or a civil war. There's a great fire in Ancyra. That's just what I needed. Plus minus 50% wealth from culture and minus 10 public order per turn. Why? Why, game? Why? Why did the why did you why did the gods of Rome too just feel the need to spit on me from a great height there? What was that for? 
Good grief. Just un outrageous. Jeez. Anyway. On the on the brighter side, motivated populace. Don't know for how long, though. The faction rises. Ruteni. The Ruteni have arisen, whoever they are. And the Syracusae have been destroyed. Oh, that would be Syracuse. So, yes, either the Romans or the Carthaginians have taken out Syracuse. It's a fine wrestling pit Sicily shall be for the Romans and Carthaginians, as Pyrrhus himself once said. Oh, I thought I was worried there for a minute, and then I realized, oh, it's Bithynia, and they're only here because they have military access with me. Ah, that's all right, then. You aren't, like, devious or treacherous, are you, Bithynia? No, you're loyal. All right, so we probably don't need to worry about that army that's just sitting there. How did you get here, anyway? You don't have military access with Lydia, do you, by any chance? No, you don't like Lydia, and they don't like you. You just, like, brazenly trespass right across their territory, in which case I salute you. That's very Gallic of you. <laughs> Speaking of being Gallic, I, I've had an idea about how we might try and get the Ptolemies to like us a bit more. And that idea is to basically just do what the Gauls do best and start raiding. And I thought, well, you know, the AI tends not to declare war on you just for raiding in this game, as I talked about in the last episode. Why not take advantage of that fact and raid the Lydians a little bit? It might piss them off. They're already pissed off with us, though, to be fair. But if we're lucky, it won't outright provoke a war, and I think that raiding them will cause the Ptolemies to like us. Because the Ptolemies do have... They actually approve of our expansionism. Now, that is hilarious. I didn't realize that anyone could ever ex approve of expansionism. I thought that was just an, always a negative. Anyway, um, whatever. Ptolemies are a strange bunch, apparently. Um, previously, well, there was a thing on there about agent actions against Lydia. They approved of that. Uh, that must have been a pre-game thing that has since timed out. Um, but uh, I'm thinking if I raid Lydia, I can make a bit of money and also make the Ptolemies like me more. That's kind of what I was thinking anyway. And I hopefully it won't provoke an outright war is the uh, general idea. In other news, I think Armenia has been getting its ass kicked by the Pontics. They've lost their province that was over here, I think, by the looks of things. Yes, Arsam... Arsam... Arsamusata has been taken by Pontus. Pontus are quickly growing in power and in territory. A little scary, but at least they're on our side for now. Um, <laughs> there's a Ptolemy agent over there. For some reason. Hi, dude. What you doing over here? Um, hopefully just exploring. I am the Let's get you over here, Pretos. Let's get you in Lydian territory, doing things. I Establish an intelligence network. There we go. Hello. Iconion rebels. Oh, the Lydians having a little rebellion. It looks like they're having a little rebellion. Goodness me. Well, well, well. Isn't that interesting? Could go and fight them, I suppose. But uh, I don't see any reason to, unless they come to fight me. Um, anyway, I was thinking of maybe hopping across the border here and uh, doing a bit of raiding with either one or both of these armies. I'm not sure. Um, seems like an idea to me. It's an idea. I'm not going to say it's a good idea. It's an idea. It's October of 277 BC, in case you're wondering about the date. I think I might have you pop Ready over. Sacrapo. Stance none. Pop across the border. Trespassing. Yep, they won't like that. And also, they're really not going to like this. Yeah, they got minus 21 to public order now there. <laughs> We're going to cause some chaos. Ah, uh, this surely will not have any repercussions I will come to regret. Surely. <laughs> These are getting some more income. Our income's not great at the minute, but that is actually mostly because I lowered taxes. Oh, public order. Why? Why? Devastation minus two. Why? We want stupid, stupid fire. Stupid bloody fire. Why? I don't know. Anyway. Keeping on top of the top of this public order is, is, is proving a pain in the bum at the moment. Still got minus 12 from cultural differences. At the moment. Yeah. 
Celtic, Celtic culture's up 32% at the moment, but still, very annoying. I'm wondering if Kaxtos might have the, the king take over this. Maybe. No, actually I won't. That's, that's alright for now. We can deal with a little bit of negative public order for the minute. We're at plus 51, so uh, we'll wear it for now. I wonder what you can do in, in an enemy province. Military administration. He does if he joins an army. Steal income. Corrupt local officials, local officials, forcing them to give you gold from the tax in their settlement. So that's what we can do in an enemy province. Administration advises local officials, thereby increasing tax rates. That's what he's doing at the moment. And culture gradually spreads your culture throughout the local province. Okay. Ineffective where your culture is already dominant. Right. Gotcha. Cool. Um. He's just going to keep doing what he's doing, I think, for now. Okay. Well, we're going to we're we're go, we've going on we've gone on a raid. Sokrapo has led the warriors across the border on a raid into Lydia. We shall see how that shakes out, shall we? Let me look on politics at the moment. We're doing all right. We're doing all right. We've got a fair chunk of this bit of the chart right now. We're still admired. We're looking good. Loyalty is relatively good. The, the Trokmi are the ones that are probably the least loyal. Yeah, they are the least loyal at the minute, but they're still plus 14, which is fine. As I said, you don't really have to start worrying until you get to minus 11 on loyalty. That's when things get awkward. Because uh, that's when your risk of a civil war or secession starts to actually go up from 0% to like 1%. Um, which doesn't sound that much, but that's like a 1 in 100 turn every time. 1 in, one in 100 turn? Sorry. 1 in 100 chance every time you hit the end turn button that a civil war will break out. Um, so 1 in 100 is not much, but at the same time, I've rolled enough 1s in my life on dice to know that it can happen. So, uh, <laughs> anyway, let's see how the rating shakes out. Ladies and gentlemen, it is January 276 BC, and war has been declared between Bithynia and Lydia. Bithynia has thrown their hat in the ring um, in the all-you-can-eat Seleucid buffet, apparently, and uh, they are now going to war with Lydia, which is interesting. This makes me inclined to join in, even though they'll probably put us at war with the Seleucids. Um, the good news is, my plan to raid Lydia and therefore boost our reputation with the Ptolemies is working out magnificently. Um, their 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 attitude is slowly but surely improving towards us, which is really good. Your embassy is most welcome. Moderate chance of a non-aggression pact now. Carefully. Still rejecting it, of course. Your words are worthy. Which has but now gone down to low. I think just for the asking, they 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 just sort of just, nah, whatever. Either way, it would be nice to have them on the side, but they're being very stubborn about it. Regardless, though, uh, I think Lydia is is amazingly weak at the moment. They've got one tatty army over here who's currently they're they're recruiting. Um, Bithynia, they moved an army through my territory up this way. I think over towards Sinope. Um, they are technically at war with Armenia. I thought maybe they were going over there to try and fight the Armenians, but I'm not sure where that went. Either way, I'm kind of feeling like, I mean, Econion is is really poorly defended. Citizen militia, armed natives. Not very good. It would be very easy for us to swoop in and just grab Econion. If war broke out, we could just do that straight away and then quickly pivot up here and potentially take out Pessinus as well very, very, very fast. Um, the Ptolemies would like us for going to war with them. The Seleucids obviously would be very annoyed about it. In fact, they'd probably downright declare war on us instantly. That's the scary part, essentially. That is the slightly terrifying part, is what will happen if the Seleucids declare war on us. What I think I need to do is recruit some more units for this army. We've got a bit of income now that's being supplemented by the raiding. Um, we need to recruit some more units for this army, some good ones, bring them down here to just sit next to Mazaka and with that, that, them combined with the garrison of Mazaka maybe means we'll be able to make the Seleucids think twice about advancing up through this pass into our territory, at least for them in the meantime. While we focus on taking out Econion and then maybe even Pestinus as well if the Athenians don't get to it first. That's kind of my thinking. 
I want to get some more land. I want some more land. Things are relatively stable and under control at home. We've got positive food. We've got positive income. We've got positive public order. Things are okay. We've recovered from that damn fire. Um, so yeah, I think now is possibly the time. Lydia is unlikely to be any weaker than this going forwards right now. They are in an absolute shambles. Uh, I don't know what happened to that rebel army that was over here, by the way. That seems to have just gone somewhere. Oh, there's a there's a Lydian army there. They've been those guys have been sitting around raiding the Ptolemy's territory over here. They have. Um, funny thing is about Lydia is I don't think they can get troops between their two provinces here without going through Ptolemy land or ours, which obviously is going to make them defending Iconion for them very very difficult. So, uh, yeah, they got a little eight-unit army there. This little army here. They're not doing great, Lydia. And I think it's probably time we started considering chopping them up, really. I think that's probably what we're going to want to be doing. However, that is going to be next time, I think, because I reckon that'll do it for an episode. I hope you guys don't mind that uh, uh, there hasn't been any battles. Um, I did warn you in advance. It might be a bit like that. Um, I do... I have to say, though, when it comes to Total War games, I do prefer the fewer battles lifestyle. Um, I like the battles to be fewer and more decisive when they actually happen. Um, I remember I used to play um, some Rome Total War mods back in the day that had zero turn recruitment for armies, and you ended up sort of like in the mid-game fighting ten battles every turn minimum, sometimes more than that, just because of the sheer amount of uh, enemy stacks wandering around the map, and it just wasn't fun. I've never enjoyed that kind of gameplay. I really like the way DEI does it, where you have these um, infrequent but often extremely decisive battles that can decide the fate of an entire war. Um, so that's good. I do like that. However, it does mean there'll probably be quite a few episodes in this series where we don't actually have any battles. So uh, I apologise if, um, if that's a problem for you. But not, nothing I can really do about it, I'm afraid. Um, just plenty of politicking and empire management which I'll be able to spin into the video intros hopefully quite nicely I hope you're enjoying those by the way um, I one of my favourite things about Total War back in the day back in the Rome Total War Medieval 2 days was the Total War forums the Total War Centre forums and the Org forums where people used to post action, after action reports which were effectively like written let's plays uh, used to get it on the Paradox forums a lot as well. Um, but either way, unfortunately, written Let's Plays have largely gone the way of the Dodo these days. Um, if you go on the Total War forums these days and you go to their AAR section, it's all just people posting links to their YouTube videos nowadays instead of actually written proper, awesome written Let's Plays. And back in the day, people did loads of them, and a lot of them were genuinely amazing. They, they were awesome bits of historical fiction that were framed around a Rome Total War campaign. Um, some of them were just absolutely magnificently well written. Uh, obviously there, was, there were a lot of quite sort of knowledgeable people used to play back in the day who were on the forums, you know, people with actual like, you know, historical degrees and stuff like that who happened to be big Rome Total War fans. I mean, the Europa Barbarora mod back in the day for Rome Total War, that was literally made by actual historians you know actual actual historians and and, pro and university professors came together and made a mod for Rome Total War to make it more historically accurate and it was actually kind of amazing it attracted that kind of community around it and as I said all of that extinct these days nobody does written let's plays anymore and so I, when I when I set out to do this series I kind of wanted to bring a bit of that back with this series, with the, with the narrative intros and stuff like that. It's not a written Let's Play, but it's it's kind of a similar sort of thing, is what I was thinking in my head. Bring back some of that old school AAR magic, but in a Let's Play video format, was kind of my thinking, and hopefully you guys are enjoying it. Anyway, uh, that's about all from me, ladies and gentlemen. Wish the Galatians luck. I think next, next video, they're going to be going to war again. Have a good one, everyone. Catch you next time. Toodaloo.